you know, I figure when you do your undergraduate degree, it makes a bigger difference anyway, the way you do your PhD. Um, I'm a sociologist by training, a rural sociologist. And uh, if I insist on being called doctor when I try to talk to students about social inequality, it seems a bit disingenuous. So my name's Ralph. It's not necessarily the name I would have picked, but it's the one my parents gave me. So you guys can call me that. Um, I figure there's a couple ways we can do this. The most important thing is it's going to be interactive. You guys have to talk, OK? And you have to tell me stuff, answer questions, throw stuff out to me. I've got a bunch of PowerPoints, and they're like PowerPoints. They can dominate everything, which is not the optimal way of doing things. Or we can have a conversation, and we can use those where they're appropriate. And um, yeah, go from there. And if you don't mind, tell me your names when you talk with me. It's a whole lot better than KU or whatever. Okay. I can see some, most of you got your names out. I know a couple of you have seen some of these slides before, so if you have, Shut up. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, first off, what do you guys understand epistemology to mean? I mean, it's a fun word. It's a word you never want to say with an ice cube in your, in your mouth. It comes out kind of weird if you do. But what does epistemology mean? Uh, your base knowledge. Uh -huh. Base knowledge. All right, so epista is a Greek word. Where's our... <laughs> Myron, <laughs> right? What does it mean in Greek? Uh, epistemi, it mm -hmm. derives from epistemi, which is science. Okay, science. Knowledge, science, understanding, and if you throw an ology on the end, what does that mean? Study of. study of. So study of knowledge, study of understanding. In essence, we could talk about it as how do we know what we know. And one of the things we want to talk about and spend quite a bit of time about, if we can, is just that. How do we know what we know? Oftentimes we can do a variety of different things, we get results, and sometimes the results work, sometimes they don't. But uh, if we don't understand why they work or why they don't work, that's an issue. It's hit or miss. And a lot of stuff that we do, a lot of stuff that we think we understand, basically is hit or miss. Wouldn't it be cool if we understood why it worked or why it didn't work? Kind of do I have a little punch button thing? Uh, it doesn't work in this room. So wow, I think that's it exciting. does. Better. I get to control the remote, which is kind of a right, isn't it? Okay. It's a man okay. Thanks. So, first and foremost, I want to I want to make an argument. There's no such thing as value-free sociology or social science. Now, I don't know what all your backgrounds are. I know a lot of you have a social science background. Has this been a topic that you've heard about before? This striving toward a value-free social science. Or is it, do we even have to go into this? Value-free is in, it, it's, it's not biased, it, it, it's only the facts, man. It's kind of like dragnet, you know, just give me the facts, man. And it doesn't have to be interpreted. Facts speak for themselves. I think that's awful. Yeah, I think it's ludicrous, quite frankly. Um, I'm going to make an argument all social science is value-based, and that's okay. Um, as social scientists, we have to deal with human beings as both objects and subjects. And, and as objects, we can objectify human beings. They can be very easily studied as objects. You know, we're three-dimensional, we have mass, we exist in time and space. And if you're a demographer, that works. You can say there's 25 people over here, 10 people over here, X many of them have these characteristics, X many of those have those characteristics. And that works, and we can look at them as objects. But if we have 150 people in a room, and 149 of them are standing over there with their backs turned to one over here, that doesn't get us very far. So we have to understand what is the meaning of what they're doing. Okay? If 149 people have their backs turned to one person who's standing on the other side of the room, demography doesn't get us there. Looking at human beings only as objects doesn't get us to where we need to be. We need to understand why the one is over here and why the 149 over here have their backs turned to that person. Okay? So we have to understand human beings as both objects and subjects. <clears throat> subjects who think, act, interpret, and do something with what they're interpreting. Thanks. Which button do I hit? Cool. You like, too. Okay. Um, and so we, we're going to look at this in a variety of different ways. What I would like to emphasize then is it's okay to be 
value-based, because that's what human beings are, and that's what human beings do. So we have to look at objective in two different ways. There's two different ways that, that it's oftentimes used. One is things in and of themselves. It's an object, so this thing. This is an object. I don't have to interpret it to bring it into existence. It exists in and of itself. Me not thinking about it doesn't make it disappear. Okay, But if something's subjective, it means that it is subject to my interpretation of it. Okay, um, If I stop thinking about this, it doesn't disappear. But if I stop thinking about a relationship I have with a person, chances are that relationship goes south for a while, then disappears. Okay, And so we have a little bit of a difference that we have to recognize. Another way we use objective is that they're replicatable by subjects. In other words, it's objective because I told you what I did, I told you how I did it, I told you why I did it, I told you what methods I used, what data I used, and then said, go do the same thing. And if you can go do the same thing, that is also objective. But it's objective in a little different meaning of the word than it's just simply an object unto itself. Does that make perfect sense? Is it clear as mud? Mm -hmm. You guys are not being very participatory, yet, so this is going to have to change. Yes, it is. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Bill. I'll pay you your five dollars. Okay. Good. The middle. Okay, so um, we're going to look at human beings as objects and subjects. We, I think we need to spend more time on the subjective element of human beings, okay? And one thing we need to talk about then is what I'm going to call context and perception. So what do you guys understand context to mean? This is where you guys participate. <laughs> well, use like a Dr. Dixon's analogy of like an artifact, uh -huh. which is like a piece of information or any kind of tool or something you can basically see or interpret about everything around it. Um, it has sure. so he uses that analogy called like I mean, archaeology, like an artifact, its convenience or whatever. But for us, you, I mean, you have to compare anything to all other knowledge, uh, other situations, or it just doesn't have any meaning at all. If you're, if you're like lecturing to a class, and um, you don't know whether the people are students, toddlers, prior military, or sort of like our context. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so, <laughs> but I mean, you could have all military or toddlers, or, yes. and it changes the whole situation, even though you might be talking about the exact same thing. Good. So. I had a, an anthropology instructor when I was at Utah State University doing my undergraduate, and I was doing a minor in anthropology. And they had this whole array of artifact stuff, okay? lined up, and then they had a contest to try to guess what the stuff was. Now, but that was the key. It was completely decontextualized. So you'd look at something, and you'd think of a thousand different ways, some of which weren't appropriate, that people could use stuff. And then you wrote down your answer on a piece of paper, and you put your name on it, and you slipped it into a box. And if you appropriately guessed the right thing, and, you know, and what it did, then you won some kind of prize. But it was so decontextualized that there was no way you could guess what the stuff did or what it was for. And that was the whole purpose. That was the whole learning point that they were trying to get across, is that you can take a common, everyday kind of product from something, but if it's pulled out of its context, it's not so common, nor so everyday, and you lose all this different information that's coming in to help you interpret it. How about perception? Billy, you've already spoken. Okay, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you can't get five and more dollars. Me, sir. Oh. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> Sorry, Ralph. Excellent. <laughs> what was perception? Yeah. You've got two in front of you here. Well, if I say it wrong, I'm this guy. Uh-huh. Uh, but if I say it right, I'm this guy. Oh, excellent. Okay. All right, so let's see, where, let's see how this goes, boy. <laughs> <laughs> perception would be the receiver or the uh, person's... Uh, how their, their glasses, their colors, their their past, Good. their makeup, their experiences, and how they received that either data or situation or language or whatever. Good. So our con, Myra, go ahead. 
No, I mean, just from a pure communication perspective, it's the decoding of an encoded uh, communication. Could be okay. visual, could be uh, You want to human. decode that encoding you just did? <laughs> <laughs> it's how we deconstruct a message that has been constructed either in a visual communication or it has been constructed by somebody else, a human being. Good. So are those two the same thing? No, but perception. Good. So can you have, yeah, this one is always going to be continued on that one, isn't it? And it goes both of them. You can ask that. You can have perception without the context. As you, it could be a, a wrong or um, an, an, an unrealistic perception. Good. But you, you, you may have. So if you if you uh, don't know how to interpret a context, you may end up with an erroneous perception. Yes. Is that accurate? But, but, yeah, but, but it's part of life, you know. As you have said, I mean, things may, may seem you know, uh -huh. realistic, but you, if you don't understand the context, you will really, really interpret. Lately, we've been hearing a lot of what's called an epistemic loop or epistemic closure. So we're going back to that nice word, epistemic, epistemology. Okay, the idea of an epistemic loop or an epistemic closure is if I think it's true, it finish it for me. Must be. Must be. Okay, and so the argument is, let's go back to let's go to the last presidential election. I have a very good friend who's very, um, very high up in the Mitt Romney campaign. Okay, he's, uh, yeah, he was he was looking to be in the cabinet. Kind of thing. I told him he's got a lot more time on his hands now. He can travel with me. Um, <laughs> but three three four months ago, I was talking with him, and he said, and we were talking about the upcoming election, and I said, um, you guys are going to get killed by the women, the female vote. He goes, no, we're not. And I said, yes, you are. You are going to get wiped out by the female vote. And he goes, no, all the polls we have tell us that that uh, Mitt's polling high with women. And I said, who are you talking to, Kurt? Who are you talking to? Because uh, everything I see and everything I'm talking and everything I'm reading and all these other kinds of things tells me you're going to get creamed. Well, guess what happened? You got creamed, most particularly by the unmarried, okay, yeah. unmarried, never married females, and uh, highest margin in U.S. electoral history. So they were completely convinced. And he told me afterward, after the election, he said, every one of us walked into that uh, election night into the Boston headquarters convinced we had won. I said, how, how could have you have done that? How, how did they do that? Why, why were they convinced they'd won? Yeah, what were, they, what were they reading? What was the context? What was their perception? What were they it looking at? They were totally skewed up. Right? Yeah, so what happened is the other thing that we found out is that they were not polling people who didn't have landlines. So cell phone only generation. Well, who's the cell phone only generation? Yeah. I have three daughters, <laughs> none of which are married. I can tell you who the cell phone only generation is. Right? They were not being polled by the Republican establishment because they weren't even on their radar screen. And so their polling may have been accurate to a particular context, but that context was people with a landline and maybe a cell phone, but they had at least to have had a landline. Okay? And so all the information they were getting back, the perception of it was based upon a particular context, but unfortunately, context was an incomplete one. They didn't do a very good job of it. I'll just go ding, ding. as a subject, not an object. What's that? It's a treat as a subject. Yeah. Maybe I'll just treat it as an object. <laughs> just forgot, is it? Jake, just Jake. as an admin question, uh, when anybody has a, a question or a comment, if you could speak up just a little bit more, uh, the folks on the other side of the wire appreciate it. Context. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Okay. So I think we already answered that one with the next one. Okay. So a little bit of an experiment here. If you've seen this, don't blurb it out, okay? Um, 
You know, we now have Google Earth, and uh, it's a very uh, interesting tool, if not invasive tool at times. It's always interesting to go and hover Google Earth over something you're familiar with. And go, oh, okay. um, before we had Google Earth, we had Landsat photos, which were not terribly good. I remember when the buildup to the Iraq war was about, are these things centrifuge devices, or are they something else? And there are these interesting, blurry photos. So I went back onto the internet, and I looked at the, um, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I started looking at the pictures that had been taken by Landsat photos of what were supposedly, you know, um, medium-range ballistic missiles. And I thought, oh my goodness, you would have to be really, really perceptive to see that in those blurry, awful pictures. You used to have people who would absolutely train in these kinds of things because they had to be interpreted, because they weren't nice, clear Kodak moments. Okay? So what I want to do is I want to show you a Landsat photo, an old photo. And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about it. So if you could, okay? Well, first off, let's just start by narrowing the data. I want you to tell me if the dark areas are water or land. Water? What makes you think they're water? You can see islands uh, in the light color. Okay. So there's some and definition. Points. How about like this? Oh yeah, that sign River. is that sign is something else. Land. Hmm? That's water. That's land. Okay. That's Spain, that's France. Now, I once showed this picture in an introduction to sociology class at Mississippi State University, and a young woman said, it's a frog. Now, that's been over 20 years ago, and I still can't find the frog. It's the French. She swore. It's French. <laughs> there we go, it's French. <laughs> she swore it was a frog, and she was swimming there. Does anybody see anything different than land and water? Something, for example, that might be, go ahead, it's Blake, right? Depending You're the one who's speaking incorrectly now. When and what I'm in is taken, it could be, it could be a what it is. Okay. Cascading shadow on the ground. Maybe over here? Yeah. And the white, white spots could be where the where sun is reflecting. You want to be Blake or Mark? <laughs> 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 Mark on this one. Mark. <laughs> with the ladder. All right. So, does anybody see anything that might be found in a in a barnyard, a farm? I'll get out of the way. Cow's head. Oh. See the cow's head? Yeah. Next one. Both from there. So here's the cow's right ear. Next. Forehead of the cow. Next. <coughs> Left ear. Next. Yeah. All right. Um, I gave you a false context. I totally led you on. And every one of you fell for it. What's the river on its forehead? What's that? What's the river on its forehead? It isn't. If you go back, yeah. it's a sailboat. It's just a really crappy photo. That's all it is. It's just a bad photo. It's like from Photography 101 with somebody with a bad camera that they purchased at you know, Salvation Army. It's a bad photo. But I could give you bad intel about what that photo is and create a context that completely changed your perception or at least what you thought you were perceiving and what you were looking for. All right, let me give you uh, another one. Yeah. Hit backwards to go forward. Yeah. That makes perfect yeah. nonsense. Yeah, there you go. Great. OK, so let me show you another one. I want you to tell me what's happening in the picture I'm going to show you next. And I want you to start contextualizing what the picture is. Where is the action occurring? How do you know that? Okay. How are they dressed? What does that tell you about what's going on? And then, what's their emotional state, if you can devise? First off, we, we know they're from Vermont. They're all in flannel. <laughs> okay. So um, look at the picture. And more particularly, look at the context surrounding the picture to try to address what's happening. Just fire away. Don't, don't wait for me. 
Okay, yeah. They're all looking down. Like they're looking out over the observation deck. Somebody's giving them a dare, maybe. Paul, you have a comment? Yeah, they kind of do, don't they? They look like a little bit of agony there. Are they on a boat? What's that? Are they on a boat? Are they on a boat? No, not on a boat. What would make you think that? Uh, I was just wondering if that was like the boat that's lodging area. Okay, good. And the ropes and all that. Yeah. So, I think you're looking at the same thing that somebody over here says. Scaffolding. Scaffolding. All right, so, so now you're marked. Good job. All right. <laughs> scaffolding. And where do you find scaffolding? Usually at a construction site, not generally in someone's living room, right? Paul? I was going to say, you can also pump Good. 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 So they look heavy, don't they? Hmm. What are those things? And it's Mark also to, to me, it looks like they're praying they're holding their heads. Yeah. They're praying. praying to the goddess of discus throwers. This person is the high priest. I don't know. <laughs> standing in line for a soup kitchen. It's standing in line for a soup kitchen, but pretty heavy plates. So look at, the, look at the incongruities going on here. There's a lot of information coming from this one picture, but you start to see that if you if you make a conclusion about like these are plates, it runs counter to a conclusion that they look heavy. Are they plates or are they hats? Okay, good. So they could be hats, but if they're hats, that would that would uh, uh, that would explain the guy's short necks, right? If you've already got a guy wearing a hat, so why would he be holding a hat? Yeah. Where, that's and they were hard do they have hats. handles on them? How many hats yes. have handles? Uh, at least four, five. <laughs> Excellent literal interpretation. <laughs> I like it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> See how this works? This is great. It's like a depression era, like time frame. Okay. You don't see yeah. exactly. wearing overalls very much. They've also got that. Unless of course you're in Vermont. Right? In shape look with the big torso. I don't know uh -huh. if that's like a diet thing or just the style of yeah, it's called eating potatoes. Yeah. Their hair is. I mean, yeah, so you can yeah. you can pure you can put it into a period or an era. Alright? Does that help you explain what's going on? Mm -hmm. It might, but let's let's start with the most obvious strange thing in this picture. To me that would be these. What are those? If they were lunch pills, they'd have Batman or Spider-Man or something. Barbie. <laughs> if one of them had Barbie, they probably wouldn't be in that line. <laughs> it could be canteens, actually. Canteens? Okay. It can help that one in a circle, like, concave, or... Right here, like, first one, yeah. Yeah, it's actually concave. Bills of commerce. Could, could be. Go back again. You're talking, you're getting there. Machinery, you've got scaffolding, the construction site. <laughs> the precursor to the iPod. <laughs> Radio. Whoa, where'd you get that iPod? It's like, like it's some sort of ceremony inaugurating something, and they all have a part of it. And this guy's leading the charge, or mm -hmm. whatever the ceremony is, and they're looking down at this, whatever this item is that they're starting. Union workers. Okay. Being fired. Okay. Could be. Look at this guy's posture. Can somebody lean out that far without falling over? No, he's got a strap over there. He's got a bar and he's scaffolding there. But in front of his. The rope. Yeah, he's got scaffolding. It looks like he's leaning on his lap. Yes, the ground. Keep going with it. It's uneven. Marshall, keep going with it. Oh, yeah, same thing. First thing. Keep going with it. Don't stop there. Well, so they're on the What would outside. these have to do with glass? Oh, they're so window glass? Are these the scaffolding for window Are they breaking it? What are these in conjunction with glass and construction? Suction? Suction, Suction cups. So this is a picture at a construction site taken through a window of men carrying a pane of glass. This guy's steady in the dock. <laughs> now, I have to tell you, my intro to social students who are freshmen usually get this within two minutes. <coughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but there's a, <coughs> there's a reason why. It's because they tend not to overanalyze a concept in some respects. I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Is they're like, oh, 
couldn't be iPods. They start by a process of elimination. We don't start by a process of elimination. We start by a process of throwing more things in. They tend to start by a process of elimination going, well, based off what they already know. Well, those can't be iPods. Mm -hmm. Oh, look at what they're wearing. That's not very classy. Blah, blah, blah. And they figure it out fairly soon. Point about it is you can use a context to help you come up with a perception of what's taking place, but oftentimes you're going to get um, contradicting evidence from the same interpretations, and then you have to work them out. It makes sense. If these are plates, why do they look so heavy? Excuse me, kind of an argument. Okay. One more. This was just kind of a study. Check it out. What do you see? Yeah. yeah. Bad picture. Once again, taken by the same person who took the picture of the cow, I'm sure. Okay. <clears throat> so, the whole idea of perception is it literally depends on your point of view. Where are you standing, both metaphorically as well as literally? So, I'll give you a couple of examples here. <laughs> Lennon never made a better shot in his life. I think it's worth reading. I don't know what year it was. Yeah, that's true. The, the three point line was. Yeah, and then the three point line got further out. <laughs> <laughs> the queen never looks like it. This is my all-time favorite. Well, it's like, wow, that's just frightening. Count the feet. And this one we just call the long arm. <laughs> All right, so yeah, a little bit silly, but nonetheless, the idea is if, if you're just changing even just a few feet, you're not going to see what those pictures capture. So part of the argument, again, is if you want to get context in order to feed perception, what should you do? That's a question for you guys. It's not rhetorical. If you want to better interpret, uh, interpret a context, what should you do? Is that a different yeah, try different perspectives. So in, in the scientific literature, most particularly in the social sciences, we oftentimes call it triangulation. Come at it from different perspectives, at least three, that's the amazing term to try. Um, come at it from a variety of perspectives and see if you can get a different angle on something and a different perception if you do. All right, here's, here's kind of the classy one, I think. Classy in a really weird kind of way. Tony, Cheerleader pleads guilty from Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs, Colorado, 26 year old man who masqueraded as a female cheerleader at high school pleaded guilty yesterday to criminal impersonation. This is going to catch us all, so we've got Myron in here too. Ah. All right. <laughs> Judge Richard Hall said Charles Doherty unlawfully assumed a false name and enrolled at Colorado High School to get a public education. Doherty kept up the ruse for eight days dressing with the cheerleading squad and claiming to be a transfer student from Greece. Okay. School <laughs> officials were suspicious and found that computer records he presented were false. Doherty's sentencing was set for February 4th. He could get up to two years in jail. Blah, 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 blah. And then a 16-year-old student who befriended Doherty after he enrolled in September said some students had doubt. He wore women's business suits, blazers, high you know, and skirts, high heels, had a lot of makeup on, etc. Et Doherty said after the hearing he wants to get a high school diploma and become a psychologist. Okay. So is Doherty a man or a woman? All right. Objectively, what is Doherty? What kind of plumbing are we assuming Doherty has? He's a man, but he wants to be a psychologist to understand why he wants to be a woman. <laughs> Excellent interpretation. All right. So for for eight days, subjectively, what was Doherty? Male or female? Female. Objectively, he was always male, we're assuming. I haven't got the rest of the data, and I don't really want it. Okay. Um, <coughs> so, again, we've got ambiguity that's built into the system. Anytime we have to deal with human beings as both objects and subjects, we have to recognize that human beings are, in fact, both objects and subjects. And that we can count. If we were counting, if we just went into the classroom and counted, would Doherty have been counted as a male or a female? As a female. As a female. All right, does it matter that we counted Doherty as a female when, in fact, on an objective level, Doherty is a male? Good. It could. 
Yeah, exactly. It depends on why we're counting. Yeah. So we're going back to the context and what the context does in terms of informing our perception. Did she vote for Robin? <laughs> Probably voted twice. Well, we got to vote twice. Okay, so if we take this a little bit further, I'm going to ask you: How do you read these kinds of things? So um, we have a great term, legibility. All right, another great term. Um, legible. How do we make things legible, readable, understandable, interpretable? Okay, so if we go back. Let me go back to this. We read this thing, all right, and it has a certain kind of social legibility to it. We read it, we go, oh my gosh, that's interesting. I mean, something like this, why would it ever show up in a newspaper? It shows up in a newspaper because we find it fascinating, we find it interesting. So there's a certain social context, a certain social legibility to it. That makes it interesting to us. Like that. Somebody masqueraded as a Greek transfer student for eight days. If we go back then, how do we make things legible? How do we make things readable? Why, do, why are they even, why is that even interesting to us? So one way to think about that is let's start defining some terms. What does legibility mean? I think I already told the answer. Let's see if you're paying attention. Able to understand. Yeah. Able to understand. Readable, you can interpret it, you can give it some kind of credible meaning, right? To make it readable, to make it understandable. Um, so, how do we make a social world legible or readable? Via, via constructs. That's Good. Right. Define that further. Constructs, uh, concepts. Correct, everything. What is a man, what is a woman, uh, behavior, uh, all kinds of stuff, all of that are constructs, social constructs that we have been. Tall. We've been uh, uh, hammered into us at times. Oh, yes. I remember um, when I was doing my undergraduate work, I, I was a forklift driver. I still back in whenever I park now. <laughs> 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 you know, forklift driver for five years. And I was working with this guy. I can't even remember his name now. We just called him Opie. He's about as big. And he kind of had a Napoleon complex, for lack of a better phrase. He was probably five foot four, but put on the real tough guy kind of image. And one day, myself and one of my uh, workmates were asking him if his son, if he had a son, his wife was expecting. He said, "So if he's a boy, what if he wants to be a a, a ballet dancer?" He goes, "I'd break his legs." <laughs> I said, "Siri, you'd break your you'd break your boy's legs because he wanted to be a, a damn well break his legs." Okay, all right. All right, so this idea of, of constructs, concepts. I tell, I tell my students that as a sociologist, I fundamentally do not study things. I study concepts. I use things to help me understand those concepts. I don't study communities. I study community. But I look at communities under this larger construct of what it means to be community in order to understand what's happening here on the ground. If I'm studying communities, I have an N of 1, and always remains an N of 1, this community versus that community. If I'm studying community, I have an N of however many communities I've looked at. And it allows me to make comparisons on a conceptual level, on a construct level, that goes beyond just what's happening in this one place at this one point in time. We don't study families, we study family. We don't study power, we don't study politicians, we study power, et cetera, et cetera. And if I do that, it opens up the avenue by which more things become even more legible because it gives me more text. I'm using a heck of a lot of metaphors here. And a heck of a lot is a good BYU phrase for a hell of a lot. Okay? A lot of metaphors here, but what it's allowing me to do is expand my base of context if I'm thinking conceptually, if I'm thinking in terms of constructs. I have not abandoned applying them to things, but it's not the thing that's important to me in this respect as a researcher. Ultimately, I want to change the thing if that's my mission, but I have to change it predicated on an understanding of where this thing fits in a larger context of other things that are similar. So I have to think conceptually. 
The other thing about that is if I'm thinking conceptually, as a sociologist, what a historian writes is relevant, what a uh, politician writes is relevant, what a novelist writes is relevant. All of that becomes context that I can bring to bear on a larger issue because I can link them up across conceptual handles that make sense. All I'm stuck with is the history of the place and what I can gather by some kind of interviews or surveys. I don't have much. I have to be able to contextualize, locate this place at this point in time in something conceptually much, much larger in order to have a really good handle on what's happening with it. Okay? <clears throat> so, um, <coughs> we'll give you another kind of thing. Basically, we're all trained to see certain things. Oftentimes, we don't even realize that our socialization allowed us to see some things and miss other things. Um, how many of you speak another language? Okay. Um, I like to brag that I speak English and profanity <laughs> as well as I speak Indonesian and Thai. I can get in trouble in Cambodian, but not out. And um, and I understand a lot of Arabic, but I don't speak much. Okay. But I speak Indonesian really, really well. And I translate. And there are concepts in Indonesian that fundamentally cannot be expressed in English. They, they just simply don't even exist in English, and vice versa. Do you guys, those of you who speak another language, do you find that? Mm -hmm. That there are certain things that just don't exist? And you try to translate them over, and you just go, ugh. And I used to have to translate um, verbatim for people who, would get, who were talking. I was their translator. They were speaking in English, and I was having to put it into Indonesian. And one day this gentleman was talking, and I was speaking to an Indonesian audience. And he started talking about American football. Well, first off, even though yesterday in the New York Times there was an article about American football happening in India, which I found <laughs> fascinating, um, nobody has a clue what American football is in Indonesia. Why would they? If you say football, they're going to think what we call soccer. Okay, And so... He's assuming a context that fundamentally doesn't even exist, but he's using it as a metaphor to try to get a point across. First off, most things never work. It's you know, bilingual puns are tough. I'm going to diverge for a second. In Thai, if you're a male speaker, you end all of your sentences in crap. It's just, it's great. If you're an American guy, you can say crap all the time. Crap, 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 crap. It's really kind of fun. In northern Thailand, where I spend most of my time, crap becomes cup. So every morning I go out for a walk when I'm in Chiang Mai, and there's a police officer sitting there, and I walk by and I go, cop, and he goes, cop, and I just crack up laughing because I have made him a victim of a bilingual pun, and he's completely <laughs> oblivious to it, but it just made my day. Okay? So going back to the American football. So this guy starts talking about this guy who played American football. He was 6'9", 423,000 pounds or whatever. And the Indonesians, and I'm trying to figure out how can I get this message across, and I'm just realizing I can't. So I said, he played American football, you might not know what that is, but it takes big guys to play. Okay, uh, so I patched it. And he said, and he did a flying tackle. Now, those of you who speak another language, translate flying tackle for me. <laughs> In your language. <laughs> So, you know, it makes perfect sense in the context of American football, <coughs> flying tackle. So what I did is I said, he jumped in the air, grabbed him, and knocked him to the ground. Mm. Eh, it worked. But it lost something, didn't it? It had to lose something, because those concepts are unique to a particular context, American culture and American football. So we're trained to see, read, understand, decontextualize certain things. We generally take those things for granted. Um, unless we're also trained to see that we're taking them for granted. So, the question is, how do you get trained in the first place? I'm going to ask you another little silly question. What do you see in this picture? This is from northern Thailand, by the way. Rubbing his eyes. Rubbing his eyes, I heard somebody whisper. It's in the book in my hand. Yeah, so Sarah, what, what is that? Fly. Fly on the wall. I mean, what about that? It works. <laughs> <laughs> it works. All right, so if, could you go back for me? Oh, never mind, thanks. 
When I show this picture, almost everybody, regardless of what context I show it in, you might see that, but your attention is generally drawn to the human being, right? Not always, but generally, most people are going to look at the human being, he's got his fingers up like this, and they start trying to describe what his emotional state is. Mm -hmm. Looks like he's got a headache. Oh, he looks sad. Looks like he's worried. When all the while, the, one of the issues could be the fly on the wall. I'm using a really bad common metaphor, but it works. Um, so, what are you trained to see? We're very anthropomorphic. We tend to think that the most important thing in a picture is another human being. Might not always be the case. If I'm a microbiologist, which I was before I became a sociologist, and I discovered that I'd spend my entire career looking at people's bodily fluids under a microscope in a windowless room, I changed my major. Um, I might have a very different perception of what I'm looking at in a picture versus a human being, for example. But most of us in the room are social scientists, or at least hang out with social scientists, either by force or by volunteer. Okay, and so we tend to gravitate towards the anthropomorphic element of any conflict. So an iso. <laughs> this is what we're looking for. When we contextualize things, we're trying to observe patterns. Patterns that can actually be defended. Patterns that, from multiple perspe perspectives, remain patterns. Okay, Something that we can look at from a variety of points of view and figure out, hey, this is unique. This is, this is something important. Why is something important? It repeats itself across a variety of perspectives over time. Now it's coming on me to figure out why. So if I show you this, um, is it legible? Is it readable? No. And tell me something about it. It's legible that you can't. So, so, yeah, so um, for example, here I can see Sparla Dawa book in the Works for me. Easy for you to say. <laughs> so here's another one. Rabbit. Cool. Axe. Rabbit axe. That could be very interesting. Um, if I were to show you a similar one, and I, and I actually have one, I just didn't get it over to Nicole on time. If I were to show you a similar one in Thai, would it matter even if I bounded the, the letters? Would it even have mattered to any of you? Oh, the no. code is different. The code is yeah, different. the code's different. You and thus the context is shifted. You have no way to, really <coughs> to have any kind of perception of it. Out of it. Well, it must be a word. He put some bounding around it. I could have put bounding around something that wasn't even a word, and I could have basically sponged you into thinking that it's a word, right? It would have been really easy. Um, Thai, by the way, has 44 consonants and 24 vowels. Overdo it. All right. So another to get to something from that mass of letters, something that makes some kind of sense, we're going to simplify. I'm going to All right. You have to simplify. So I have to take the data and somehow figure out how to bound it, how to make some kind of contextualized sense out of those data, out of that information. We make it simpler. Take something, make it less complex. So. We do that by looking for patterns. Things that repeat itself. And patterns are always contextual. How would you know what is a pattern if you didn't know that in the particular context these things constantly happen? Now I remember last time I was here in March. Um, one of the, I think he was a colonel, I forget. Um, he said, let me give you an example. There were a bunch of people hanging out out in the middle of nowhere in the desert. We had a satellite photo of them hanging out there and we knew they were terrorists. I said, how did you know they were terrorists? We just knew. I said, but how did you know? And his comment was, why else would they be hanging out out in the desert? <laughs> but then he took the story further. And he said, he said, let me tell you why this program is important. So then I went and talked to the social scientists. And they said, yeah, that happens all the time. Here's the context in which it happens. And he said, we came that close. I remember him telling me very distinctly, he said, we came within millimeters of pulling the trigger and blowing them all up. He says, so your job is to train these guys to tell me who I should kill and who I shouldn't. I said, wow, no pressure there. <laughs> okay. 
And, but the point of it is really, really good. If you don't know what patterns are in a particular context, how would you know how to interpret them? How would you even have a clue what a certain objectifiable outcome would be if you can't put the subjective interpretation on it? Does that make sense? So you can always do the objective stuff. Anybody can do that. A three-year-old can count to 50. They can go one, two, three, four, five, and they can get to 50. You can look at a photo and you can count 50 guys out in the desert. <coughs> but what does 50 guys out in the desert mean? Like, so are you dancing around the fact that language is... I'm not dancing around anything. I'm okay. very direct. All right. Are you basically saying the language is relative and it has whatever value we assign to it? Oh, absolutely. I'm saying that. There's a really good book, and I'm, I'm forgetting the author's name at the moment, but the name of the book is um, through, the, through the Window of Language. 2010. And basically he argues that you don't even realize what you're doing with language. For example, in, in many languages, words are gendered. So in Spanish, the word for bridge is very masculine. In, in German, it's feminine. And if you look at bridges in Germany and in, and in Spain, Spanish bridges are thick and bulky. German bridges are sleek and narrow. Nobody sat there and got, oh, let's make a sleek and narrow bridge because I'm a German. It's called the Sapir Whorf hypothesis, by the way. Yeah. It comes way back in the 1920s, where Sapir, as an anthropologist, social linguist, came up with the argument that language is not just applying labels to things. Language is actually how is your window to how things are interpreted, used, manifest, everything else. Go ahead. So you're not buying into universals then in the perfect heaven? Say it one more time. You're not buying into Heavens, no. Okay, got it. Um, no, about as far away as I can get from that. Got it. Is that what, what are patterns in one context may be completely meaningless in another context. Okay. But what is universal is that we're looking for patterns. That, okay. It's necessary but not sufficient. The sufficient part is how do we interpret objectifiable patterns through a theoretical, a conceptual, a construct, a construct, um, subjective explanation. That's why I'm starting with the premise that it's okay to, to realize that so social science is not value-free. It shouldn't be. If it's value-free, we divorce ourselves from the ability to actually interpret the thing that human beings do and do well, and the only things we know how to do, but the only animals that we know that know how to do that, even if we think dolphins might, we have no really good subjective interpretation of that yet. Okay, but that, even that has its limits. Absolutely. It always has limitations. You are never, ever, ever going to land on the truth. Right. Because when you enter into ethics and morals, you're, you're going to be drawn. You're going to. You're going to. That's where you're going to hit your gate for objectifying. You can. But well, you're you doing can. it. You're doing it by. And that's a really good point. You can do it, but you're doing it as a subject, knowing that you're violating certain subjective, subjective other principles. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. So in other words, if you want to take the stance that you're going to do, get the truth and right. do objectifiable science, you've, you've taken your most powerful tool that you have out of your arsenal. Okay? So the people in the desert, were they nomads or irrigation ditches or what? <laughs> you know what? I can't remember what his explanation was, but, but, but they... What they did find is that, yeah, this is a really common thing, and I forget exactly what it was, but a couple of the people in the group were able to ex explain it, and they said, we came that close to just go, because we were working on our assumptions of an objectifiable outcome, putting our subjective interpretation of the context on. In Canada, Canada we have very similar situations. I, would, I wouldn't have known that. Yeah, but, but you know, I'm from the West, and I do understand the issue of water. Our state engineers in Colorado and Utah, they only have one job, water. That's it. You think state engineer in Missouri, you don't think water for Kansas. No. Then how do you deal or account for cultural relativism? You account for it by accounting for it, okay. knowing that you're never, ever, ever going to land on the truth. Okay. So if you take the terms literally, ethnography, literally means you're an outsider looking in. 
So ethno meaning folk or person, folk methods. The argument of an ethnographer is different. It, it's a very specific type of qualitative methodology that makes the assumption from an anthropological perspective that you are an outsider and you can never, ever, ever know what it means to be an insider. I'll give you an example. I was doing some work in, uh, well, I did some work in Mississippi, the Mississippi Delta, where I was looking at um, subsistence-based lifestyles. And I was making an argument that subsistence is not informal economy, that they're different. If you think of informal economy, that's somebody doing a stopgap measure until they can make ends meet, and they get a little better economic situation, and they go back into the formal economy. Subsistence is a lifestyle choice. It's predicated on, on uh, barter and exchange. Nobody wakes up, yawns, and stretches in the morning and decides they're going to be a subsistence producer. It, it requires an incredible amount of bonding social capital. Okay? Um, because reciprocity is oftentimes two, three, four years down the road. For example, in one of the Mississippi studies that I was looking at, <clears throat> um, guy was a fisherman. He was a white person who fished. And he would fish for three or four months with a commercial license out of the year, and he would put five, six, seven hundred pounds of fish into freezers and outbuildings. He lived in a 55 by 12 foot trailer with his mom, not terribly high status. Okay. He was in his 50s. But he would throw impromptu fish fries just on the side of the road. Throw an impromptu fish fry. There he is, doing the fish fry. He would exchange things, fish for, as he referred to them, a mess of beans. He might not get them back for six months when the beans were up. And he was fishing in early April. But there was this informal accounting mechanism, sometimes stretching out over four or five years. Not terribly rigid. But just, you know, he was working with other people who knew they owed him something, but not necessarily defined as to what it was. In 1993, there were a whole bunch of fires. There was a drought. Okay, there were a whole bunch of fires all throughout the Midwest and the South. There was a drought. And um, he used to throw fish fries for the volunteer fire department in his area to make money. Okay? And he would charge for well, in 1993, when there were a whole bunch of wildfires, the volunteer fire department left a far more affluent person's home and let it burn to go save his trade. Okay. okay. All right. So now, that there's so many layers in there of that's not informal economy. That's subsistence, and it's predicated not just on the economic milieu, but also on the social one as well. So, up to Vermont. I decide I'm going to go up to Vermont in the fall of 2001, and I'm going to see if the same kind of patterns are replicating themselves in this back-of-the-land kind of state, Vermont. Well, it was interesting. I started going. I started getting into the networks, and then September 11th happened, and people closed their doors, shut their windows, stoked up the hearth, and just stayed indoors. I got a lot of reading done on that sabbatical. But here's my point. I used to think... And I remember distinctly thinking, this would be really cool to come in here and live this lifestyle. And then every time I think that, I think, I can't, because I have an escape clause. I'm doing it as a choice. And, and because if I'm doing it as a choice, I'm not living the same lifestyle. I can never understand, ever. I can try to empathize. I can try to put some conceptual boundaries around it but I can never live what it means to have to live this lifestyle because I'm doing it as a choice. And the consequence of that is I'm going to put different conceptual handles on it on a personal level. Does that make sense? That was a long winded way to get there. Yeah. Um. Uh, Ralph, have you read Nickel Good Night? Yes. So, Barbara Aaron. Yes, yeah, so classic example um, of exactly what you're discussing. How, how many of you in here have read the book Nickel Good Awesome book, worth reading. It's um, a study in sociology uh, of a woman who decides to see if she can make it on minimum wage. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, but the subtitle is is in not making it. In That's America. right, exactly. Yeah. On how not to make it in America, yeah. she takes uh, several jobs, several case studies in which she discusses um, how she has to live and what she has to rent to be able to live on minimum wage. But the reality is. At the end of the day, she still gets to go home to her university life 
and have food on her table and pay her bills. So, yeah. And she talks about that. She she even talks about telling. So she worked at she worked at Walmart. She worked at a uh, as a maid in a hotel, and she worked as a Mary Miss and then as a waitress. Four different things in different parts of the United States. And she would tell people that I'm writing a book, and they go, "That's nice," <laughs> because it was so. Not an issue to them. It's like she was talking about working, these people were working sometimes as many as four jobs and sleeping in their cars trying to make it work. And the book's like uh, late 90s, early 2000s. So um, it was some tough times for this book. But it's a really good point. Is she talks about that. She's very reflexive about that and says she always knew that she could just pull a plug on the project and go home. So again, it's not arguing that there is an ultimate truth that you can land on. It is arguing, however, let, let's take another tack, okay? This is a good, good topic if everyone is okay with that. Um, philosophers oftentimes talk about truth with a big T versus truth with a little T. You're not going to access truth with a big T. We live in relative truth. I have to tell the students I take over to Thailand and Indonesia that they have to look before they cross the street because every one of them is going to look as though traffic is coming on the right side of the road. It's on the left side of the road. If they don't look, that relative truth is going to kill them. Okay? Relative truth is important. We oftentimes get in these weird ideological arguments in the United States, I think in particular, that we're all about truth. Well, the nice thing about truth is today's truth is tomorrow's folly. Is, um, you know, what we're interested in knowing is what do people interpret as the truth and act upon? So there's a, there's a sociologist, he's now dead, most great sociologist. And his name was W.I. Thomas. And I have this theory about uh, prominent social scientists. They always go by initials. So W.I. Thomas had this dictum that he said, what's perceived to be real will be real in its consequences. So the argument takes in both an objective outcome and a perception. If, if I think it's going to happen, I act as though it does. We call it a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, you know, junior high, my wife teaches junior high, and some religion should saint her. Anybody who teaches junior high should be sainted. Just a walking bags of hormones with no brain cells. And it just takes a real special person to deal with junior high kids. When I was in junior high, before I even knew there was such a thing called social science, I was an avid social scientist in practice. I would get with my buddies, and we would gang up on a friend. Bob. Bob would come in, the first guy would go, Bob, you look sick. I'm fine. No, no, dude, you look sick. Second guy, Bob, Bob, you look really bad. Are you okay? By the time four of my friends had told Bob he's sick, Bob has puked on his shoes. It was cool <laughs> to a junior high student, having no idea what we were doing, but it was kind of a neat classical experiment. So Bob goes home, sick. Right? The objective outcome is Bob was sick, but we planted, you know, inception, we planted the idea. Um, so back to the relative, uh, relative truth, little t, big t. Your job as a social scientist is not to understand big truth. That's one of the big issues that has screwed up our disciplines forever. Your job actually is to understand relative truth, the truth that people actually live with and act on. And you can only do that to a certain extent. And thus, you have to have multiple perspectives where you ask multiple stakeholders, actors, and everything else, and you tie it into a larger framework. So let me give you another really quick example of tying it into a framework, if I can. Um, it's on here on the slide somewhere, but I'm not going to worry about getting there yet. We'll just jump ahead. I was doing a USAID project in Indonesia, northern Sumatra, um, rubber plantation. Okay, and. Uh, <clears throat> this was a project where Indonesia had, as a government, had a program called Transmigrasi where they moved people off from the island of Java where there's 110 million people and it's five-eighths the size of Kansas to the outer islands. And they would set them up and they would um, give them 15 hectares of land and it's kind of like homesteading in the United States, much of what made Kansas Kansas okay, in 1862, the Homesteading Act. So they would send them off to Sumatra, and they put them on these rubber plantations. And I don't know if you've ever seen a rubber plantation, but the trees 
are scientifically planted seven feet apart. It's just perfect symmetry. I'll show you a picture here in a bit. Um, but rubber trees take seven years to grow before they produce latex. So in the meantime, you have no canopy. The sun's coming down. Weeds grow up. The ingenious idea of USAID animal scientists and agricultural economists was let's give these guys something to do while the rubber trees grow and mature so they can tap them. So we're going to give them hair sheep. It's just kind of a funny name. Hair sheep. So they're, they're adept to uh, hot, humid climates. They're not wolves. So they put these hair sheep out there. They're supposed to eat all the weeds and stuff growing up around the maturing rubber trees. So it helps the rubber trees grow. It gives them an animal that produces milk and meat, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody's happy. That's, that's the grand scheme. The problem with this is that hair sheep are not indigenous to the culture of Javanese. Nobody knew how to take care of a hair sheep. So the animal scientists come to me, the social scientists, and say, Who's taking care of the sheep? Because we have to build a tech pack. We have to build an instruction name on how to take care of the sheep. All right, now before I get there, um, there had been a whole bunch of social scientists who had done a variety of studies and they had come up with the conclusion that the ibu, which is the mom, took care of the sheep. Okay, I lived on Java for many years. A couple of things about Javanese culture. You don't self-aggrandize. In other words, you never talk about yourself. You don't talk about yourself. And it's patriarchal. So if you're the male, you do all the speaking, but you can't speak about yourself. So they did these surveys. The previous social scientists did the surveys. They did the interviews, the surveys. They come up with, lo and behold, super evil, super mom. So we had this whole list of stuff. Who folds the laundry? The evil. Who takes care of the sheep? The ibu. Who watches the kids? The ibu. Who does this? The ibu. Who does that? The ibu. Ibu does everything. Super ibu. Okay? So I went out with the intent of showing something different. First off, let's go back to the conceptual arguments, the, uh, the contextualizing things. In the peasant economy literature, and there really is such a thing, there's even a journal called the Journal of Peasant Studies, which is a great journal. And the peasant economy literature says there's two types of economic activities that people can do. There's primary economic activities and secondary economic activities. Secondary economic activities are money-saving activities. You tend sheep. You grow a garden. You do things that saves the household money because the household is the economic unit of analysis, not the individual. Primary economic activities is you earn money. Okay. Peasant economy literature says kids are always engaged in secondary economic activity. Women are often engaged in secondary economic activities if primary economic activities are not available. But given the option, women will always be engaged in earning money because it gives more degrees of freedom to the household. All right, knowing that, and we're getting these survey results and these interview results, that uh, women are taking care of the sheep. There's a disconnect. There's a disconnect with a large body of literature saying we shouldn't be finding that. All right, given what I've already told you, what should you expect? Why were they giving those answers? They're answer? talking to the men. They can't say they did it. They were talking to the men who can't say that they are the ones doing it. And so what did they do? Like the remark, sorry, said not the woman did it. Huh? They said the woman. Said the woman does it. And so we get these results. And what do you do with the results? You turn them over to the animal scientists who then write a tech pack on the anticipation that a mature woman is the one leading it, taking care of the sheep. The other thing I found out is I went out and I started doing the interviewing in Indonesian. And we had one question in the interview, and I was doing this on purpose. I set out a whole bunch of people to do surveys, randomized surveys, because I wanted to have my own baseline. So I sent them out to do randomized surveys. One of the questions we had in there was, if you could have one thing, if you could do one thing on your farm that would improve your economic standing, what would it be? During the preliminary research, we already knew it was to have a cow. Every Indonesian interviewer, cow, 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 cow. Every person I interviewed, sheep. Now, I was working for a sheep project, and I was the white guy coming in from outside. And I said, look, I have no control, none, zero, zip, nada, whether you get a sheep or not. And I asked the question again, sheep, every time. 
without exception. Every time an Indonesian asked the question, cow. So I just, I just withdrew myself from this interview at that point. Okay. Then what I did is I hired Indonesian social scientists, women, and I put them in the household. And I used the extension corporate, the extension service that they were working through there. And I said, look, we'd like the women to actually live in the house for a while so they can, under the rules of helping out, observing how people take their sheep. And I had them document every member of the household's labor allocation across a three-day period. And they would say, the eight-year-old boy, two hours doing this. The 13-year-old girl, four hours doing that. We went through the whole thing. And one of the ironies, too, is when I'm interviewing the father, because he's the only one talking, saying, who folds the laundry? He's folding the laundry, going, oh, the Ibu does. And he's folding the laundry. Okay. So then I took the survey research, and then I took the data from what the girls gathered. Okay. And then what they did, what these women did, is then I had them go to the household next door for another three days under the auspices that they were helping that household, but to avoid what we call the Hawthorne effect, they were looking at the household they just left. So it wouldn't be a self-fulfilling prophecy. So from survey data, guess what we get? Super Hebrew. From the observational data, what do we get? Eight-year-old boys are taking care of the sheep. Matches the literature perfect. Okay? The relative, no, knowing that you're dealing with relative truth that is always contextualized, one of the most important things you can do because then you can start looking at literature, even if it's not dealing with Afghanistan. And you should start getting an idea of larger macro-based patterns that then are more contextualized into what's happening on the ground. We call them research concepts, or, or excuse me, theoretical concepts versus research concepts. Research concepts should always be subsumed under larger theoretical concepts. That was kind of long. I'm sorry about that. We need to take a break, stand up, and do something.